It's September 21st, 2015 in Washington, D.C. Josh Ernest hurries through the west wing of the White House, floorboards creaking beneath his polished wingtips. Ernest is the White House press secretary, and he's speeding towards the press room, now running a little late. There's less than a minute before today's press briefing is set to begin. Ernest picks up the pace, but he knows there's a good chance he's behind schedule. He was double-checking all his facts, facts he has to be sensitive about, because every day he delivers the news to a room full of journalists. There's a military action abroad, tragic violence at home, the latest corruption on Wall Street. But today, he's trying to be extra careful with a scandal that's unfolding involving Volkswagen and its diesel engines. Ernest is fixated on the story. Maybe he thinks because the company so blatantly endangered the public's health, or maybe it's because Volkswagen went to such incredible lengths to lie and got away with it for so long. Either way, the whole world is watching, and Ernest must accurately convey President Obama's thoughts on the matter. He reaches the press room office and spots his assistant. Ah, sorry I'm late. They're all in there waiting for you. Ernest nods. He smooths his dark blue suit and takes a moment to compose himself. Inside, reporters fill all 50 seats. As Ernest nears the podium, their chatter quiets down. He steps in front of the blue curtain backdrop beside an American flag, and he begins taking questions. Reporters ask about the embargo on Cuba, a visit from the Pope, military relations with Iran. Then Ernest points to another reporter. And I wanted to briefly ask about the, um, the Volkswagen emissions scandal. Um, has the president been briefed on this, and how closely is the White House watching what's, what's transpiring? Ernest pauses and gathers his thoughts. There's a lot he wants to say. The federal government has launched into action, and Volkswagen will soon face enormous consequences. But Ernest knows right now he has to weigh his words very carefully. He can't fully reveal how the administration is going to respond. Well, this is obviously uh, an enforcement action and an investigation that uh, the EPA is responsible for carrying out. Uh, they take the responsibilities that they have to enforce the Clean Air Act very seriously. Ernest takes a moment and makes a decision. It's time to warn Volkswagen, even if the threat is subtle. I think it's uh, fair to say that we're quite concerned by some of the reports that we've seen uh, about the conduct of uh, this particular company. So, Has the president paid attention to this as well? Has he been briefed on it? I haven't spoken to him about it, but I'm confident that he is uh, uh, well aware of the news. Ernest wishes he could say more, but for now, he's gotten the point across. Volkswagen is in trouble, and the administration is not looking away. As Ernest continues fielding questions, he wonders just how many of his friends and colleagues own a diesel car with a Volkswagen emblem. All of them are victims of a serious crime, and they deserve justice, he thinks, and he hopes they get it. But Ernest has no illusions that it'll be easy. Volkswagen is a powerful company backed by countless lawyers and a deep well of money. If the U.S. government wants to hold the automaker accountable, it will have to put up a fight. From Wondery, I'm Lindsey Graham, and this is American Scandal. In 2015, the world woke up to shocking news from the auto industry. Volkswagen had cheated air pollution tests for its diesel vehicles with what was known as a defeat device. The revelation prompted global outrage, and while the German automaker wasn't the first to game the system, the scale of its misconduct was unprecedented. Owners of the vehicles demanded immediate compensation, and American government officials began building legal cases against the carmaker. Inside Volkswagen, a feeling of panic emerged, as executives started wondering who among them would be forced to take the fall. This is episode three, Crash. It's September 22nd, 2015 in Wolfsburg, Germany. Volkswagen CEO Martin Winterkorn stands in the lobby of Volkswagen's headquarters, gazing across the building. On most days, this space is alive with energy. Executives and employees hustling about, visitors gazing open mouth at the vintage cars on display. Classic Volkswagens, as well as Porsches and Audis, Volkswagen owns these brands, too, and for eight years, Vinterkorn was in charge of it all. 
But on this morning, the lobby is as somber as a graveyard. Vinterkorn can't remember the last time it was this quiet. He makes his way to the elevator. His body hurts and his head aches. He presses the button for his office on the top floor. After the war, this soaring brick tower stood for German progress and resurrection. Volkswagen was the pride of Germany. Now, seemingly overnight, it became a national disgrace. As the elevator rises, Vinterkorn can't help thinking that he's entering a burning building. The Americans have filed hundreds of civil lawsuits against Volkswagen. His lawyers say criminal charges against the company and its CEO are inevitable. And suddenly, it's clear to Vinterkorn that he can only fight so hard. There's only one way he can put out the fire. Vinterkorn reaches his office and quietly closes the door behind him. He looks across his decorated walls. There are plaques and framed pictures of himself shaking hands with world leaders. He sinks down into his chair, opens a desk drawer, and pulls out a sheet of paper. He selects one of his finest pens. There's no point in putting it off any longer, so Vintergorn begins to write. I am shocked by the events of the past few days, he writes. Above all, I am stunned that misconduct on such a scale was possible in the Volkswagen Group. As CEO, I accept responsibility for the irregularities that have been found in diesel engines. I have therefore requested the supervisory board to agree on terminating my function as CEO of the Volkswagen Group. Vinterkorn pauses. He could leave it at that. Many CEOs would. But he can't help himself. He dashes off the neck several lines with a rush of adrenaline. I'm doing this in the interests of the company, even though I'm not aware of any wrongdoing on my part. Vinterkorn signs his name and drops the pen. He's given the world what it wants, a scapegoat. But not entirely, because he's also proclaimed his innocence. Two days later, Matthias Mueller strides down a hallway at Volkswagen headquarters. Today, a news reporter is at his side. The two stop outside Martin Vinterkorn's old office. There are movers busy at work, swapping out Vinterkorn's old desk for one more suitable to Mueller's tastes. Mueller waves to them cheerfully, and he tells the reporter that he's thrilled to finally update the decor around here. It's just the first of many changes Mueller will bring to Volkswagen as its new CEO. Mueller is 62, with a lean build and silvery white sideburns that frame a ready smile. In many ways, he's the ideal successor to Vinterkorn. Mueller has proven himself as a top Volkswagen executive. He ran Porsche for five years, and he ran it well. He's also the kind of media-friendly CEO that Volkswagen needs during these trying times. Vinterkorn appeared cold and inaccessible, but Mueller comes off as warm and engaged. His appointment is a signal to the world Volkswagen is serious about changing its ruthless company culture, the same culture that led to the diesel scandal. Mueller leads the reporter over to a large window overlooking a canal. This, Mueller thinks, is a nice, picturesque location, a good place to discuss Volkswagen's future and recent past. Mueller shakes his head and tells the reporter that what occurred with the diesels was shameful. Nothing like it will ever happen again. Vinterkorn had no choice but to step down, Mueller adds. But in his opinion, it's wrong to condemn the man. The reporter cuts him off, asking how exactly is it wrong? The defeat devices were engineered under Vinterkorn's watch, and they allowed Volkswagen's diesels to emit harmful air pollution. Mueller's smile falters just a bit as he tells the journalist that he's known Vinterkorn for 20 years. There's no way that Vinterkorn had anything to do with the defeat device. In fact, Mueller has ordered an internal investigation that's certain to unmask the true culprits. He concludes the interview with a rhetorical question. Do you really think a chief executive had time to work on engine software? It's December 2015 in Wolfsburg, Germany, and Matthias Müller is approaching the Auto Uni. The building is an enormous structure of steel, glass, and stone and serves as a research center for Volkswagen. But today it's also going to serve as a venue for a major announcement. Müller heads towards the building and sees the event already has a crowd. Journalists are filing in, packing the building. Müller reaches the rear entrance and an aide leads him down a long hallway. At the far end is Hans-Dieter Posch, the bespectacled chairman of the Volkswagen Supervisory Board. Mueller sees that Polch is holding several documents bound with paperclips. They're the results of Volkswagen's internal investigations about the diesel scandal. Today, Mueller will sum up the investigation for the crowd, and he knows he won't have any trouble. But when he enters the main auditorium, Mueller can't help but pause in shock. 
There must be 300 journalists seated in black folding chairs. Their voices echo and amplify in the cavernous space. And suddenly, Mueller finds himself surrounded by a wall of cameras. He blinks rapidly, hit with a barrage of flashes. He moves past the cameras and heads to a large white desk marked Volkswagen. It's here that he and Poch sit down in front of the microphones. After opening remarks, Mueller begins his presentation. Good morning. We believe we have made significant progress in recent weeks. I want to stress the seriousness of our internal investigation. We have relied upon 450 experts. We've collected more than 100 terabytes of data. I understand that you are all eager to know how something like this could have occurred. Our investigation is ongoing, but we have come to some important conclusions. A journalist waves an impatient hand and shouts, What conclusions? If I may proceed, I'll tell you. The wrongdoing was the result of weakness in some processes and a mindset in some areas of the company that tolerated breaches of rules. What do you intend to do next? Naturally, we will improve our methods of checking and authorizing software for use in our vehicles. Can you be more specific, Herr Mueller? With all due respect, we're not here for technical trivia. We're here for names. Who in Volkswagen is guilty? Mueller allows himself a slight shrug. The fraud was engineered by the misconduct and shortcomings of individual employees. Nine of them have been suspended. I will not be disclosing their names at this time. Mueller can feel the disappointment ripple through the crowd, but he has said all he is willing to say today. Already Volkswagen's stock price has nosedived. Its legal teams could be tied up for years. Clearly, these are dangerous times for his company, and he must tread carefully. The reporters all begin to shout at once, and Mueller feels like he is standing alone at the bottom of a very deep hole. He knows he must start digging his way out, and as fast as he can, if he's going to save the company. It's December 2015 at the Washington, D.C. headquarters of the U.S. Department of Justice. Winter is settling over the Capitol, and John Cruden is thankful to be indoors in a warm conference room. Cruden is an assistant attorney general at the Department of Justice. He holds the position for the Department's Environment and Natural Resources Division, which means recently he's had his hands full with all things Volkswagen. Right now, in this conference room, he's focused and alert, despite having been here for hours without a break. Cruden is a West Point graduate and a veteran, and he's learned that sometimes slowing down is not an option. That's especially true with a case like Volkswagen. The way the evidence is piling up, this case may prove to be one of the most significant of his career. He knows that he and the other lawyers on his team are in the midst of a serious undertaking. They're crafting the DOJ's civil suit against Volkswagen, and if they're going to beat the automaker in court, they must do their job flawlessly. Cruden still gets angry just thinking about the scale of the deception. Volkswagen sold some 600,000 of their diesel cars to unwitting Americans. Cruden reminds his team that for violating the Clean Air Act, the company needs to pay, and needs to pay a lot. His team is mostly united, but there is one lawyer who looks up from his paperwork with a sideways glance, declaring that he thinks they're overreacting. The lawyer points to a highlighted section, explaining that the harder they push Volkswagen, the harder the company will try to escape its full responsibility. Volkswagen, he says, has enough money and power to pull off a serious injustice. He's seen it many times before, and he thinks it's wise to play it safe. This is a high-profile case. The department cannot afford to get burned. Cruden shakes his head firmly. There's no way he's taking the teeth out of this lawsuit. And he explains why. Volkswagen acted in a deeply unethical way, and the Department of Justice has an ethical obligation to pursue the company with everything it's got. He sees heads nodding because they know what's coming next. Cruden reminds them, in many ways, this is personal for him. He spent his legal career protecting the environment, and he's never seen an automaker trying to pull anything this underhanded. Justice must be served. He looks directly at the lawyer who suggested a softer treatment for Volkswagen, and he asks if he supports the strategy they're going to take. All eyes in the room fall on him as he mulls an answer. Finally, the lawyer nods. Cruden smiles. Good, let's go win this case. Cruden believes this suit will hold up in court. It could force Volkswagen to pay billions, but it's not money he really cares about. Cruden is hungry for justice. He wants to hold Volkswagen responsible for the mess it made, and ultimately, that could mean going after the executives responsible for the diesel scheme. But, Cruden thinks, that one dissenting lawyer is right about one thing. This fight will not be easy.
American Scandal is sponsored by Worthy. It was a very hard decision, but one you knew you had to make. Diamonds are forever, they say, but your marriage wasn't. That's okay. You're already feeling better, though it'll take some time to fully move on. But there's still that question. What will you do with the ring? It seems simple. Get rid of it. Or keep it. <sighs> it's not simple. If you do decide that now is the time to sell your diamond jewelry, do it the smart way, with Worthy. The last thing you want now is to feel shortchanged. Just visit Worthy.com to schedule a free, secure pickup, fully insured by Lloyds of London and tracked by FedEx. Then Worthy's expert gemologists prepare your jewelry for auction, but you're in control at every step. You choose what price to accept, even after you've sent in your jewelry. Then get paid quickly within just a few days. Don't go to a pawn shop or a local jeweler. Get up to twice as much for your jewelry when you sell with Worthy. Go to worthy.com slash AS to get started. That's worthy.com slash AS. It's December 2015. Mark Winnett drives into a car dealership in Phoenixville, Pennsylvania. His face is hot and red. It gets that way whenever he's really embarrassed or angry, and right now he's both. Winnett thinks of himself as a mild-mannered, non-confrontational type, but the more he reads about the Volkswagen case, the angrier he gets. He was taken for a ride, and today that ride is going to end. Winnett parks his car and kills the engine. He jumps out and slams the door, standing in the middle of the lot. His jaw is tight. He hears footsteps and turns around to find a young salesman emerging from the office. The salesman is smiling, but that quickly fades when he sees the look on Winnett's face. He asks whether he can help Winnett, and Winnett barks back an answer that, yes, you can take this car off my hands. The salesman is taken aback and asks Winnett for an explanation, and Winnett launches into it. This is a 2014 Jetta diesel. Winnett bought the car from this dealership, and everything was fine until he saw the news. The salesman looks nervously at Winnett and runs to grab his manager. Winnett cracks his knuckles and paces as the salesman returns from the office. After a moment, the manager emerges too, buttoning his jacket against the wind. He greets Winnett and asks how he could help him. Winnett answers swiftly. He wants back every dollar he spent on this diesel car, all 28,000 of them. The manager frowns and apologizes. This hasn't just been a shock for customers, he assures Winnett. It's hit dealers too. The manager wipes his brow and offers Winnett a pleading look and then a compromise. The dealership can offer Winnett partial compensation, but it can't fully pay him back. That's out of the question, he says. The dealership would go broke if it bought back every diesel car it had sold. Winnett unclenches his fist. He knows he's up against a wall, so he asks, how much? The dealer furrows his brow. 14,500, he says. Winnett's shoulders slump, and suddenly his tone grows pleading. How am I supposed to get back the other $14,000 I lost on this car? The manager throws his hands up and says he can only offer the same advice he's given all the others. Call a lawyer. There's a class action lawsuit brewing, and Winnett can try and get a piece of the settlement. So he returns to his car and mulls it over. Class action lawsuit. He likes the sound of it. Volkswagen owes him, and he's glad he's not the only one ready to collect. It's January 11, 2016, and Matthias Mueller is roaming through the Detroit Auto Show. Normally, he'd love being in the middle of a car show with all the stunning new vehicles and crowds of enthusiasts. Instead, Mueller is feeling irritable. This is his first trip to the U.S. since becoming CEO. It should be a victory lap, not an apology tour. He hates apologizing, but if that's what it takes to regain the American people's trust, well, that is what he will do. At a news conference earlier today, he offered solemn remarks. We know we deeply disappointed our customers, the responsible government bodies, and the general public here in the U.S., he said. I apologize for what went wrong at Volkswagen. We are totally committed to making things right. Mueller wasn't lying. He is committed. But he also wishes people would find something new to talk about. And now, as he roams across the main floor of the auto show, trying to find a distraction, a young man approaches with a microphone and flashes press credentials. Mueller groans. He's been ambushed by a journalist. He can't decline the interview. One thing he's learned, when you're CEO of a disgraced company, you make time for everyone. You never miss an opportunity to show the world that you're a good man and how very, very truly sorry you are. With a sigh of resignation, Mueller gestures for the first question. 
The reporter notes that Mueller said it was a technical problem, but that the American people feel this is not a technical problem, it's an ethical problem that's deep inside the company. How will Mueller change that perception in the U.S.? Mueller winces. His apology earlier today apparently was not good enough. He reiterates that it was a technical problem. The issue was that Volkswagen didn't understand American law, but that's not an ethical problem. And he tells the reporter he can't understand why you'd say that. The reporter looks incredulous because Volkswagen intentionally lied to the EPA. Mueller can't let this statement go undefended. He leans into the microphone and makes it clear. Volkswagen did not lie. The reporter reiterates his question. How will Volkswagen change American opinions of the company? The reporter's raising his voice now. He asks again, what kind of proof does Mueller have that Volkswagen is changing? Mueller's patience is evaporating and his blood is boiling. This has been enough back and forth, he decides. So he ends the conversation and says he's working tirelessly to change Volkswagen, but that it takes time. Around him, Mueller notices people starting to gawk. So he ends the interview and walks away, wondering if this job will ever get easier. Maybe talking to the reporter was a bad idea, he thinks. Volkswagen is still in a very deep hole. And with today's impromptu interview, Mueller may have dug himself and the company a little deeper. Later that month, Matthias Mueller is inside his office in Wolfsburg. He studies Volkswagen's latest financial reports. The numbers are complicated, but the overall picture isn't. For now, Volkswagen will survive. Mueller feels a wave of relief. But the relief doesn't last long, because as Mueller considers the broader picture, a sinking feeling sets in. Threats loom in every direction. The U.S. government is suing Volkswagen, and the company could be on the hook for a vast sum of money. And the problems aren't just in America. Volkswagen is facing scrutiny from government officials around the world. It's a frightening time for Volkswagen, and Mueller knows that. To steer the company straight, he'll need some help. Someone who can change the company's culture. Someone who can rebuild Volkswagen's public image and help the company avoid collapse. Thankfully, that help is on the way with a new executive at Volkswagen. Mueller jumps to his feet. Please, come in. Standing in the doorway is Christine Holman Denhardt. Holman Denhardt is in her mid 60s. She has coal black hair that's carefully arranged. Everything about her seems calm, collected, unshakable. Christine, how fortunate we are to have you. Precarious times, Mr. Mueller. Mueller nods solemnly and offers her a seat. I won't sugarcoat the truth. We need your help, your expertise as we um, navigate this difficult terrain. Of course, I'll, I'll do what I can. But I'll repeat what I said over the phone. This is not going to be easy. And we're not going to change this company overnight. I I understand. I hope you do. Volkswagen hasn't faced an image crisis like this since the war. Mueller stiffens. The mention of World War II, even decades later, is a sore subject. Volkswagen's wartime history is hardly a secret, but Mueller avoids any reminder of its troubling past. That it was Adolf Hitler who pushed Germany to build the car for the masses. It was to be a people's car, or a Volkswagen. Yes, yes, but Hitler was defeated, and Volkswagen remained. Workers in this very building helped heal the economy. We saved Germany. Your workers are not the ones who saved Germany. Mueller frowns. He's not used to being challenged. Oh, really? Think back to 20 years after the war ended, with what the American hippies called the beetle, the bug. Of course, sales were tremendous. And that, I believe, is how we put behind us this nasty diesel business. We need great sales. You're missing the point, Mateus. It's not just great sales. The bug was lovable, innocuous. It said to the world, Germans aren't scary. Volkswagen saved Germany because it changed the world's perception of our country. Now we must do for Volkswagen what Volkswagen did for Germany. I understand. We shift our image. It's exactly what I want too. That's why I hired you. Because... Mueller stops himself. He realizes he almost made a misstep. Holman Denhart responds with a knowing smile. You hired me because I'm a former justice on the highest court of this country, and because I'll be the first woman on your management board. It only took the company 82 years. Yes, I know. This helps the company's image. Yes, that that is part of it. But most important, we're desperate. I am desperate. I want you to do whatever you need to to help change the culture here at Volkswagen. Take whatever steps must be taken to restore the reputation of this company. Can you do that? Holman Denhardt leans back, mulling the task at hand. 
It won't be easy, Mr. Mueller. Aggressive measures will need to be taken, and there's no guarantee of success. All I ask is for you to give me the space to do my best. You will have it, I promise you. We'll see, Mr. Mueller. We'll see. Mueller smiles, but inside he feels a knot forming in the pit of his stomach. He doesn't know that he'll be able to keep the promise he just made. Changing Volkswagen's path from within may be impossible. As Mueller weighs this mammoth task, he catches Holman Deinhardt's icy blue gaze and wonders if she already knows the obstacles that lie in her path. American Scandal is sponsored by Policy Genius. If you're like me, you've been working a while now. You found a spouse, maybe had a child, bought a house. There are people in your life that you love. So you save a bit, plan ahead, try and make their life comfortable and secure. Which is why you also need life insurance. You need it. They need it. And it's much easier to get these days. Policy Genius has reimagined the entire process to get you the right coverage at the best price, fast. In mere minutes, Policy Genius compares quotes from top insurers to find your best price. You could save $1,500 or more a year. It's easy to compare rates to find your best value. Then once you apply, Policy Genius handles all the paperwork and red tape. And Policy Genius doesn't just make life insurance easy, they can also help you find the right home, auto, or disability insurance. All at PolicyGenius.com. Get life insurance. It takes just a few minutes to find your best price and apply at PolicyGenius.com. Policy Genius. Don't get your future wrong. Get life insurance right. It's January 21st, 2016. Fog drifts over the steps of the San Francisco Superior Court. Outside the courthouse, Robert Jiffer runs a hand through his curly reddish hair and takes it all in. It's bustling today, with crowds of attorneys coming and going from the courthouse. One lawyer barrels down the steps, knocking into Jiffer. The lawyer shoots him a watch-where-you're-going look and hurries on. Jiffer smiles to himself. He's well aware that with his mop of hair, modest suit, and New York accent, people tend to assume he's a cab driver. They rarely guess the truth. Jiffer is a highly regarded litigator and a former clerk for the U.S. Supreme Court. Jiffer enters a monumental court building. It's the epicenter of justice in Northern California. Hundreds of class-action lawyers, each representing a group of Volkswagen dealers and owners, have come here with a single goal, to gain a spot on the plaintiff's steering committee. Only those on the committee will travel to Washington to guide negotiations between Volkswagen owners and the German automaker to shape a possible settlement. Volkswagen is facing a large number of civil suits brought by those who bought and sold the cars. Jiffra sympathizes with their anger. He respects their desire for a settlement. But Jiffra is an attorney for Volkswagen, and it's his job to protect the automaker from going bankrupt. At the same time, he needs to negotiate a settlement that leaves drivers feeling respected and well compensated. Jiffra thinks there is a way for everyone to get what they want here. But a lot of that depends on a single person involved in the case, U.S. District Judge Charles R. Breyer. Jiffra passes through security and slips quietly into the back of the courtroom, where the gray-haired Judge Breyer listens patiently as a lawyer makes her case for a spot on the steering committee. Her allotted two minutes are up quickly. Shortly after, Breyer declares that the lawyer can join the committee as its 22nd and final member. The committee is complete, and the remaining applicants can go home. Disappointed attorneys head for the exits, quietly grumbling. They've missed out on negotiating what is sure to be a historic settlement. Jiffer remains, though, to hear Breyer's instructions to the committee. The judge explains that he selected the group quickly, and he expects them to move quickly to arrive at a settlement with Volkswagen. As Breyer puts it, this is not a whodunit type of case. It's more of a case of how do we fix what was done. If it can't be fixed, then what is fair and just compensation for the people who've been damaged by this matter? Jiffer nods, feeling relieved. Fair and just compensation will work for Volkswagen, and hopefully bring this to a quick conclusion. It's two in the morning on April 20th, 2016, and nearly a full moon hangs over Washington, D.C. Robert Jiffer has spent the past three months in the Capitol. He's been leading a small legal team, and they've been negotiating with the Plaintiff Steering Committee, trying to find a settlement over Volkswagen's diesels. Tonight, they're still at it, practically barricaded inside the law offices of Wilmer Hale. The conference room is rank with body odor and the smell of stale coffee. Jiffer can see that every lawyer in the room looks just as bad as he does, 
haggard and disheveled after a week of 13-hour days. The lawyers from both sides are trying to remain civil, but everyone's on edge. Judge Breyer has given them until tomorrow to arrive at a preliminary settlement. Jifra wills himself to ignore the pressure and stay focused. There are still important details to hammer out if he's going to reach a settlement his bosses will accept. Jifra takes in a long breath, then stands and addresses the room. Everyone, I think I see a way to wrap this up. A dozen attorneys swivel to face him. He's got their attention. We're all in agreement. Volkswagen needs to fix the cars. That goes without saying. But what if Volkswagen doesn't stop there? What if we also help out the government? We'll retrofit state-owned buses, trucks, tugboats, you name it. An opposing lawyer shakes her head. And how are you going to make that happen, Bob? The logistics are beyond anything you can manage. Jeffrey swallows hard. He knows what he's just promised will add hundreds of millions of dollars to the settlement. But if Volkswagen wants to salvage its future, it needs to make hard sacrifices now. We'll worry about the logistics, all right? But with full oversight from all of you. I don't know. I'd need to make some calls. We don't have time for more calls. Briar wants this tomorrow. <sighs> Fine. Let's say we go along with what you've outlined so far. What else can you offer? What else? That's not enough? No, it's not enough. Okay. Well, if that's not enough, you tell me. What else? You know what else, Bob. <sighs> you want buybacks. Okay. Volkswagen will also offer buybacks to anyone who bought a clean diesel. But in exchange, I want something from you. And what could that be? Let Volkswagen give car owners the option to keep their vehicles. Those who want to do that will upgrade their cars and make them compliant. The lead plaintiff lawyer mulls it over. Jiffer extends his hand across the table expectantly. And after several seconds, the plaintiff lawyer nods and stands as well, and the two shake hands. Jiffer can feel the entire room exhale. The preliminary deal is done. Two months later, Jiffer paces up and down a hallway at the law offices of Wilmer Hale in Washington, D.C. Judge Breyer accepted the preliminary agreement back in April, but he also told both teams to get back to the negotiating table. The two sides, he said, needed to quickly hash out a final settlement. Since then, Jifra and the other lawyers have endured eight weeks of mind-numbing mediation. They owe their entire existence to D.C.'s late-night pizza delivery. Tonight, Jifra's on the phone with a government official in Texas trying to get him to agree to the final settlement terms, but it's not easy. The Texan demands assurance, clarification, promises. There are more tainted diesels in Texas than almost any other state, the official says, and makes a counter to every one of Jiffer's offers. The conversation goes on for hours until the official says he'll go for the deal. Jiffer thanks him profusely and hangs up in relief. He hurries back to the law firm's main conference room and breaks the news to the negotiators. The settlement is complete. He nearly whispers the next three words, stunned by the enormity of the figure. $15 billion. It's the largest payout by an automaker in history. Jiffer gathers with the other lawyers around the conference room phone. They call Judge Breyer and lay out the terms of the deal. $10 billion will be distributed to the car owners. $3 billion goes to programs to reduce air pollution. $2 billion goes to a program to promote battery-powered vehicles. Judge Breyer says it works for him and offers his congratulations. He'll grant his official approval in court tomorrow. Jiffer can't believe he actually pulled it off. Yes, $15 billion is an almost incomprehensible sum. But Volkswagen's top brass agreed it could have been much, much worse. So Jiffer is pleased. He stopped the bleeding and managed to keep the company alive. His success today gives Volkswagen a fighting chance. Still, he knows this is not the end of the story. The class action settlement may be almost wrapped up, but Jiffer is certain more charges will come. And when they do, Volkswagen is going to need every last penny to defend itself. It's July 19, 2016 in Albany, New York. Massachusetts Attorney General Maura Healey is visiting the state capitol in town for an important press conference. She stands in the press room flanked by the Attorneys General of New York and Maryland. Healey wears a conservative navy blue dress and pearl earrings. She wants everything about her presentation today to be uncomplicated and direct. She looks out at the room, which is buzzing with anticipation. Cameras click rapidly as New York State Attorney General gives introductory remarks, then steps aside. Healy takes her place at the podium and speaks directly. She announces that there's been a major development in the Volkswagen case. 
that not only did Volkswagen lie when it claimed its diesel engines were clean, Volkswagen is also lying about who is responsible. Therefore, Massachusetts, New York, and Maryland are suing the company and its CEO, Matthias Mueller. Haley reminds the audience of the story Volkswagen has been telling. Mueller's claim that a handful of engineers, low on the totem pole, are responsible. He says they independently initiated the emissions cheating scheme. But that's not true, Haley says. The conspiracy ran all the way to the top. Long before Mueller became CEO, he knew that Volkswagen had no intention of meeting U.S. emission standards. Haley sums up the company's crimes for all in attendance. This clean diesel was nothing more than a dirty cover-up. Volkswagen acted as if it was above the law. The journalists barrage Haley with questions. She answers each one of them in turn, and she feels pleased to have made one thing very clear today. With this new civil suit, Volkswagen's troubles are far from over. Soon, there will be criminal charges. Next on American Scandal, Volkswagen faces an aggressive criminal case brought by the U.S. government, and soon the arrests begin. From Wondery, this is American Scandal. I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did, I have two other podcasts you might enjoy, American Elections, Wicked Game, and American History Tellers. Search for and subscribe to both on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Wondery.com, or wherever you're listening to this right now. If you're listening on a smartphone, tap or swipe over the cover art of this podcast. You'll find the episode notes, including some details you may have missed. You'll also find some offers from our sponsors. By supporting them, you help us offer this show to you for free. And if you'd like to hear more of American Scandal and other Wondery shows and receive early access and exclusive perks, you can subscribe to Wondery Plus. Go to wondery.com slash plus. That's wondery.com slash P-L-U-S. You can also find us and me on Twitter. Search for the hashtag American Scandal or follow me at Lindsay A. Graham. We use many sources in writing our shows, but one that was especially helpful was Faster, Higher, Farther by Jack Ewing. And just a quick note about our reenactments. We can't always know exactly what was said, but everything in our show is based on historical research. American Scandal is hosted, edited, and executive produced by me, Lindsey Graham, for Airship. Sound designed by Derek Behrens. This episode is written by Hannibal Diaz, edited by Christina Malsberger, produced by Gabe Ribbon. Executive producers are Stephanie Jens, Jenny Lauer-Beckman, and Hernan Lopez for Wondering.